is it so the, is the NAD pool going down or is it that um, is it, are we making less or are we consuming more and what does the flux look like so could right. you yeah could you talk about what you saw there right so so that was the the biggest question we were trying to get at in mice mm -hmm. right is that, that there are these sort of two fundamental explanations for the pool size shrinking you could upregulate consumer activity and use up more of the nad or you could just not be making enough mm -hmm. and so by by tracing the turnover flux by using you know, isotope labeled forms of uh, nad precursors we, we we tried to get at that in mice um and i can tell you the I mean, the, the overall take home message from that study was that synthesis rates are maintained with age, even though the NAD levels are falling in some tissues, which means that the flux is actually maintained. And right. so that this is a little bit, you know, uh, tricky for a lot of people to visualize because, you know, the, the flux actually, you know, the synthesis and the consumption actually have to balance at the end of the day, right? So it's, right. so if you synthesize less, you know, then the production's lower and the level is going to fall to the point where the consumption is also lower because there's less available to whatever's using it. And mm -hmm. when they're in balance, that's when you'll hit your new steady state. On the other hand, if you start consuming more, <laughs> you know, the, the level, the concentration will fall. And typically there's some homeostatic attempt to upregulate synthesis to, to compensate a little bit. Um, but you either, you, the, the level um, you know, either gets restored by higher synthesis or, or it just keeps dropping off to nothing. <laughs> Right. And so, so where you land is essentially at a, a steady state that is a, at least a little bit lower if you've decreased synthesis rates. Mm, yeah. Sorry, in terms of flux, the actual turnover rate. And if you've maintained synthesis rates, then you're going to land at a flux that's a little bit normal or a little bit higher, depending on how you compensate, right? As the mm. increased consumer activity starts to use up that pool, <laughs> you know, mm. how closely are you able to match it by upregulating synthesis rate? <laughs> will determine yeah. how you stayed at that original state. And so the best data we have right now is that it looks like you're actually maintaining or slightly increasing synthesis and therefore overall flux, which is consistent with the idea that the activity of some consumers got higher with age. Right. That caused the steady state level to fall a little bit until it was back in balance <laughs> with the rate that you can synthesize it. Okay, so it is the consumption and do we know what is doing that consumption? We don't know for sure. Uh, I'm right. so certainly in the literature right now, <laughs> um, you know, th there was originally a case made for PARP1, which is something that's uh, induced by DNA damage and consumes a lot of NAD. And you see increased parlation, which is the, the product of PARP1 on, on proteins and aged tissues. Um, more recently, uh, CD38 has been suggested to be the, the major culprit. So this this is another enzyme that can consume a large amount of NAD quickly, and it's present on immune cells and endothelial cells. Um, and, and you see that that enzyme getting more activated uh, in some situations where you have less NAD. Like for instance, the enzyme uh, cells expressing that enzyme accumulate around senescent cells where there's local NAD deficiency, and maybe driving that. <laughs> right. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. So. CD38, I remember last time you said CD38 has a function, right? So like knocking it out is not good, but mm. it is also present on senescent cells. And, you know, it's like we have too many of them as we get old. So would removing the senescent cells, and so I guess removing the CD38 help raise the NAD levels, do you think? Yeah, I think that that's certainly what that's taking out a consumer that, at least in that local scenario, um, to, is certainly very important. And, and maybe globally, you know, it's been suggested to be the major consumer globally. Um, and so, you know, you're right, I am concerned that, you know, I, I wouldn't feel completely comfortable just eliminating CD38 and never <laughs> thinking twice. Um, but the, the knockout mice do do pretty well. Um, and certainly animals have been treated throughout their lifespan with CD38 inhibitors um, and, and done pretty well. So, um, I don't mean to you know raise a huge alarm that that it's a problem to to inhibit this enzyme, but at the same right. time, you know, it, it, we haven't looked that hard to see if there's a you know a function for it that we're we're screwing up. Right. Yeah, but I must admit, like in general, I assume the the kind of way that I, I would inhibit it with like apigenin is not going to be like blanket, um, as in removing removing it, um, you know, genetically. So I, I, yeah, I would assume that's fairly safe. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I think Abigenin would, you know, in vivo would only be partially effective and would have a lot of other effects as well. And so I wouldn't, um, yeah, I wouldn't imagine you could knock CD38 levels down to the point where it would really cause a problem there. Right. You said that synthesis keeps up. Well, it, yeah, it, it actually keeps up. It, they're consuming more and synthesis increases some. So the, the overall pool comes down, but but you still have. So, so NAMPT, so is NAMPT going up or down? Because NAMPT is the rate limiting. Right. Right. So yes, NAMPT is rate limiting when you're trying to go full speed. And so, so this has been a, a large part of the reason that there's been a debate, right? People have seen mm -hmm. upregulation of consumers with age and, and you know made the argument that that's probably what drives age-related decrease. People have also seen decreased expression of some of the biosynthetic enzymes, including NAMPT mm -hmm. with age. Um, mm -hmm. And including the circulating form of NAMPT, which which um, may be trafficking to the hypothalamus and, and playing a larger role that way. Um, so that, that's been the, the major argument that, that probably synthesis was decreasing, that a lot of these enzymes were obviously down. Um, what we've seen in general is that there's excess capacity for NAD synthesis, you know, in, in the basal state. So for instance, mm -hmm. if we knock out NAMPT in one copy of NAMPT in the whole mouse, make heterozygous mice, right? They have a, a marginal very difficult to measure decrease in NAD levels because that, that enzyme is also feedback inhibited by NAD mm. and so have excess capacity at baseline to maintain that pool. And, and so you really have to take out a high fraction of the total NAMPT activity to get NAD to fall appreciably. <laughs> now, because there's less NAMPT in the aged animals and less of some of the other biosynthetic enzymes, you know, there's every possibility that they're much less able to compensate that if you gave them a stress to deplete NAD, you know, then you might suddenly see that their synthesis rate can't adjust the way a young one, a young animal could. Um, and, and so that this is where we're going in the future, really trying to tease this out a, a little better to say, right. is, is that essentially the case that there's excess NAD biosynthesis capacity and you basically maintain that throughout your lifespan if you don't stress the system too much, <laughs> but that younger animals could adapt much better. <laughs> so do we think that 30% decrease in NAD is significant? I mean, it's going to cause a significant problem. I mean, so is raising NAD that important? Right. So we were struggling with this question all the time because the, you know, the, the first thing we did when I started my lab was, was <laughs> mess with uh, NAMPT and muscle. And we made a knockout mouse that, lived and looked totally normal as young adults and mm -hmm. they had about 15 percent of normal nad in the muscle and so that that's way below <laughs> what you see in aged tissues and they seem fine for for quite a while they could run on a treadmill as young adults they eventually do you know get muscle degeneration and they, by seven months of age they look like cripples um, but they can get through a period with nad way way below what we would see in normal aging so that's that's raised this question that you're raising now, you know, if 30% decrease in aging, you know, is all you see, then, then how can you tolerate such an enormous decrease in these young animals when you knock out the gene? Um, my best, my, my hypothesis for this that we're still trying to test is that with aging, you may get focal depletions, right? So you may have some fibers that actually have no NAD mixed in with fibers that are fine. <laughs> and then that overall muscle doesn't work that well because of it. It's been very difficult to test that so far because almost everything we do to measure NAD involves grinding up the whole tissue and you right. just get an average. We're trying to use imaging mass spectrometry. So the technology in that area has, has improved very quickly in recent years. And now we're getting down to the resolution where it's going to be possible to take pictures through a muscle where you look at NAD levels in the individual fibers and just ask this question directly of, you know, are there focal regions of depletion that would be consistent with this idea we have that it takes you know, 80, 90% depletion of the NAD to cause dysfunction. <laughs> we always say NAMPT is the rate limiting um, enzyme. So what does that actually mean? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, like biochemically, what does it mean to say it's the rate limiting? Um, well, we just mean that we hardly ever see a buildup of NMN, the intermediate between NAMPT and NAD. <laughs> Right. Um, so it seems like there's excess capacity there that you can have higher levels of nicotinamide and NAD than, than the intermediate. And so it seems whatever you can get into the NMN pool um, does get converted to NAD. And that's supported right. by experiments where you add, say, nicotinamide riboside and provide an alternative route to NMN. Hmm. Then you boost the NAD pool quite a bit <laughs> compared to, right. you know, so you have excess nicotinamide available to the cell 
and it's making as much NAD as it's going to make through the NAMP dependent pathway, then yeah. you add nicotinamide riboside, have that alternative way to bypass it, and your NAD levels go higher. Um, so essentially, we'd, we'd argue that there's excess capacity <laughs> above NAMP to finish the right. process. So, yeah, I mean, do we see a buildup of nicotinamide? I mean, could we boost NAMP to increase NAD? Yeah, so there's there's a, a couple of different groups now that have developed activators for NAMPT, uh, and that's very effective at boosting NAD. And we've overexpressed it. I mean, the original strategy we had for boosting NAMPT and skeletal muscle was overexpression of, of NAMPT, and that does work. You, know, pretty, you get about a 50% increase from overexpressing it. But then, the, like I said, several, at least three groups have activators now that are not suitable for human use yet. I mean, the, the drug-like properties are not great. They're having to dose them extremely frequently, um, and some of them aren't ready to even go into mice. Uh, but in principle, it works. Uh, and so there, there are going to be NAMPT activators, I believe. Interesting. I mean, do we know of any less effective but natural NAMPT activators? Like, you know, a pigeon in kills off CD38, but it does a lot of other things as well. Do we know of anything that would do that, would activate NAMPT? We really don't. <laughs> we don't. Okay. So, given those, uh, given those kind kind of dynamics where, where we've got the we're still synthesizing and we're consuming it. So, if we put external NR or NMN in, so external sources to build the NAD, uh, is it going to be sufficient to really make a difference in kind of the flux that you see? Yeah, I mean, I, I think. The best evidence we have now is that the the flux is following roughly first order kinetics. So we, we don't know what the major consumer is all the time at baseline, but the rate of turnover is almost proportional to the concentration of NAD. So when if we can boost the NAD level, well, we definitely are raising overall flux <laughs> as well. Uh, okay. Hmm. But you might just be giving more NAD to CD38 to gobble up. And... <laughs> yeah, so that's the next level question. Of, you know, which, which enzyme is getting more of it? I mean, and is one of them or a small number really dominating that signal? We, we don't know for sure, but, um, but for sure we can. We can monitor, we can actually inhibit NAD synthesis and follow the rate of turnover as NAD concentrations reach different levels. Um, and it, it's really close to first order kinetics. Some, something is, <laughs> is responding directly to the concentration. Thank you.